Police officers of Reddit, what was your oh crap moment? I was doing a welfare check at a house for a male who was a danger to himself. Only person living at the house, car and driveway, and the house was locked up. Gathered some more info and was told where a key was. Opened the door, announced myself, and started searching the house, expecting to find a body. Opened a closet door and the dude was hiding there with a rifle next to him. If he wanted me dead, I wouldn't be typing this. Dude was having some issues. Sat and talked for about half an hour. Told me he had heard me but didn't want to talk to anyone. Got him the help he needed. There were two very distinct ways this could have gone and we got the good ending. It's always nice to hear about these things when they go well because I feel like I hear about them when they go poorly way too often. Story 2. We were looking for a guy who stole guns from his ex and found him under a pile of clothes in a closet at a different house. Unfortunately, there were like seven kids sleeping in the same room, so I start getting them out of there while my partner cuffs the guy who is pretending to sleep. We decide to drag him out and I go to move the mattress to get it out of the way, and we find the stolen guns under where the kids were sleeping. Story 3. A law professor in Australia spent 20 years as a cop before becoming a lawyer and eventually teaching. In explaining the battered wife syndrome defense to murder, he told the story of a call to a little old lady's house, where she had said on the phone that she had unalived her husband. Before this incident, he really didn't understand why it existed. Why doesn't the woman just leave? Why doesn't she just go to someone else's house? Prof shows up to the door and is greeted by a little old lady saying, Come in. Would you like some tea? He goes in and she starts putting some cakes on a tray and pouring tea. He wonders if she's all there. He asked, So, you said that you murdered your husband on the phone. Would I be able to see him? She directs him to the living room where an old man was on a lazy boy chair, bottle in hand, and a tomahawk in his skull. Meanwhile, old lady is asking if he takes sugar or milk in his tea. The prof said at this moment he realized why the defense of battered wife existed. The drunk old guy had been beating her for years. He controlled all the money, didn't let her have friends. She had nowhere to go even if she did leave him. So on this day, after saying he was going to beat her if his sports team lost, she took matters into her own hands. He said this was the moment he realized that sometimes there are situations where life doesn't make sense, and people take the only way they can see. There are a lot of reasons why abused may stay with an abuser. It is rarely, rarely ever the case where they can just leave. As such, have compassion. Story 4. This happened August of last year. It was about 1 or 2 in the morning when a 911 hang-up call came in where all that was heard was screaming and swearing. I was the closest unit, riding alone as my partner had been voluntold for another assignment that set of days. So when I got out into the area, I was initially waiting for backup. However, as I was walking up to the house, I heard several voices screaming. Rushing up to the house, the first thing I noticed was blood everywhere. The floor, the walls, the door all covered to shoulder height. A distraught woman screamed and pointed me towards the living room. Once I get into the living room, I see a male and a female on a couch, both covered in blood. The male had a massive laceration on his right forearm, and the female had taken a belt and snake wrapped it around his arm to try to stop the bleeding. Seeing how the belt was applied, I knew it wasn't doing anything to stop the blood flow. So I pulled out my tourniquet, and as I prepped it, I said to the guy, This is gonna hurt like hell, but it'll stop the bleeding. I applied the tourniquet just above the top of his bicep, and knew it was on properly when he told me his hand had started to go numb. It was at that point I noticed a second deep gash on his tricep that went down to the bone. It took EMS about 15 minutes to get to the house, and the paramedic made it abundantly clear that had I not applied the tourniquet, the male would have bled out long before they got there. In the end, turns out the guy had come home drunk, forgot his keys, climbed up to a second story window and punched his way into the house, with near deadly results. Huge props to OP for the fast thinking. That day, OP really did just save a life, and that would have been absolutely horrifying for the roommates. Those poor women are probably traumatized. Story 5. A girl who was a danger to herself was dropped off at the hospital. Me and my colleague were there escorting another prisoner from custody. This girl came and spoke to our prisoner. They'd never met before, but they were making idle hospital waiting room chit-chat. The girl vanishes, not bothered. We don't know why she's there. We just assume she had gone somewhere else. After a while, our prisoner says, That girl's been in the toilet for a long time. Perhaps she's having a big poo. We laugh and then realize... It had been a while, so I start banging the door, no answer, door locked. I unscrew the lock and she sat there, wheezing and not super responsive. My colleague goes for help and a nurse comes and unzips her jacket and she's made a ligature from a sock and she's blue and not breathing. I managed to cut it off, it was on tight so we couldn't get scissors in to cut it. And she's taken through to get checked, now breathing again. My partner goes with her. I'm stood by the door with my prisoner getting air. The whole thing is stressful. This happened in the middle of a busy a and &E, ER for you yanks. People are just looking at me. Next thing I know, a healthcare assistant is running out to me because this girl is now becoming violent and my partner needs help. I can't leave my prisoner and I can't leave my partner to get beat up. 
I choose to go for my partner. This girl is smashing her head into a wall, kicking, hitting, and trying to bite. It took three of us to get her calm. I barely managed to get the assistance shout out before going in. Radio signal is poor to non-existent. Luckily, the prisoner sat patiently in the waiting room whilst we dealt with that. They weren't cuffed. They could have ran, and there was nothing we could have done to stop it. On top of all the stress that day caused, I didn't really have the oh crap moment until I was in my car on the way home. And I realized a girl nearly died five feet away from me. And I wouldn't have known if it wasn't for the prisoner paying attention to where their new friend went. I gotta know what that prisoner is in for, because they seem extremely mild-mannered and level-headed. Huge shout-out to the prisoner, honestly. Being like, hey, where's this person gone? And also just not making a run for it. Probably one of those prisoners who was kind of at peace with what they had done and their consequences for it. Story 6. As a rookie, I was responding to an alarm at a restaurant that was supposed to be haunted by a woman. The first officer that arrived was an older officer, who didn't do much and didn't ever get excited on the radio. As soon as he arrived, he asked for a second unit in a high-pitched tone. As I pulled in, he had his shotgun out and was leaned up over his hood. My first thought was, oh crap, someone is breaking in. When I ran up to him and asked what's up, all he said was as he pulled up and his lights hit the building, a woman jumped off the roof and disappeared. He was clearly shook. Me and another officer checked the building and found no evidence anyone had been there. It made an impression on me, and I never went back to the restaurant at night without another officer. Story 7. Dad is a newly retired cop, 30 years on the force. He has a couple of gems that he's told me. Last one is pretty sad, so if you have any types of ideations to harm yourself, consider this a warning. 1. While working as a patrolman, he had a couple encounters with people high on PCP. The first was a lady who cut her entire anus out and ripped the inside part out. She woke up the next day with no recollection of what happened. She'll have to be put on a colostomy bag for the rest of her life. 2. Another PCP story. Dude was butt naked in the middle of the road, sweating profusely. For those who don't know, the drug raises your body temp so people get naked because they're hot. The guy used a broken glass bottle to cut his genitalia off, balls and all. He ended up bleeding out before EMS arrived. 3. The sad one. Thanksgiving morning, dad worked a night shift and was home by 6am. I came to the kitchen to help cook for Thanksgiving and see him staring off into space. Something is bothering him. Turns out there was a bad car accident and the car caught fire. The woman inside was stuck because her seatbelt had melted to her. Dad went to pull her out and described how her skin had just crisped over, so when he pulled on her to free her, the skin just kind of peeled off. They eventually got her out, but she had suffered severe burns and was permanently disfigured. Dad ended up getting burned pretty good too on his arms. She ended up surviving, but took her life about six months later. That one, my dad couldn't really ever shake. I think he blames himself for not getting her out sooner. That kind of heartache comes with the job, I suppose. Story 8. I was a rookie cop in a small town. I was driving to check on a report of a large group of kids causing a disturbance at a school parking lot late at night. I realized I had not tested my PA speaker, which I planned on using to disperse the crowd. On my way to the call, slowly rolling down a residential street at 2am with my windows down, I decide to tap my PA mic a couple of times to check it. First two taps, I can't tell if it's working. I slow down. I tap the mic several more times. Definitely hear the loudspeakers that time. At that moment, I hear, What the hell are you doing? I look out my passenger window and see this old dude sitting on his porch in his underwear looking upset. Our eyes locked. I realized I had no decent excuse for clicking my loudspeaker in a quiet neighborhood in the middle of the night, so I didn't say anything back to him and I floored it up the road. Definitely an oh crap moment at the time. Maybe different than what OP's looking for, but I got tired of the traditional war stories. The awkward on this encounter was through the roof. Story 9. Witness to autopsies. Watching the Emmy pull the testicles out from the inside, or the needle in the eyeball to get samples of eyeball fluid, or the sights, sounds, and smells of the bone saw cutting through the skull, and the following suction sounds of the top of the skull being pulled off, or... Check welfare call. Call to check on a 50-ish year old lady who hadn't been seen for a couple of days. Got to the apartment, looked through a couple of windows after no response at the door. Last window I checked had to try and get my bearings while looking through half-open blinds. Realized she was there, dead in bed, eyes open. I've seen plenty of dead bodies prior to this call, but that one gave me the heebie-jeebies. Or, another dead body call. Died in his sleep. I'd been in the bedroom for a couple of hours making notifications and requests for remains removal. A belt slid off the treadmill and hit the treadmill belt pretty loudly. There was no reason for that belt to fall off the treadmill. Edit. Dang, I have so many. Okay. Patting down a male arrestee for a female officer. Dude was passed out at a green light. He was already cuffed. Right as I got down to his right ankle, I heard it. It sounded like a garbage disposal choking on pudding. Dude crapped himself right there. I didn't say anything. As he sat down in the back seat, the female officer went to the opposite side of the back seat to assist in buckling him in and gagged. Oh god, what's that smell? She said. He just crapped himself. Story 10. Got a call for an emotionally disturbed person. 
arrive on scene and a 350-pound man built like an NFL lineman is passed out on the floor face down. His wife says he suffers from PTSD from the first Iraq war and that he was an army ranger. He had been drinking heavily. His son is on scene and about 16 years old. The man begins to wake up and proceeds to smash his forehead into the ground repeatedly. We call for an ambulance. A small pool of blood begins to form on the floor. The wife grabs a rag and goes to wipe it up when the guy's head jerks up real quick, his face contorted in rage. He grabs his wife by the neck and throws her clear across the room onto the couch. We immediately jump up on him, but he is preternaturally strong. There are four of us, and we each are fighting one limb. The kid jumps in and helps us get two sets of cuffs on him because one set was not wide enough to connect his wrists behind his back. I ride in the ambulance to the hospital with him while he glares at me angrily reciting his military registration number, and telling me I won't get any information out of him and that I'm a towel head? I don't remotely look like I'm from the region. The entire ride I hope he doesn't break out of the cuffs. If I'm being honest, I'm not sure we could have regained control of him if the kid hadn't helped. Story 11. Was on a traffic stop. My sergeant came and backed me up due to possibly having to tow the vehicle. My sergeant's vehicle was behind mine and we were both in the right lane. My sergeant was sitting in his car and I exited my car to go talk to him. As I walked closer to his car, I heard a vehicle's engine rev all the way out, but I couldn't see it. For a split second, I knew what was going to happen and thought, oh crap but couldn't react fast enough. The vehicle I heard smashed into the back of my sergeant's SUV, which struck me, throwing me into the road. The driver was completely hammered and didn't have a license. This happened last Sunday, and I have surgery in a couple of weeks for my knee, and my sergeant has a broken back. Story 12. Not a cop here. This is more of a story of how I unintentionally gave a cop an oh crap moment myself. I had a night job managing a liquor store in a very bad neighborhood. It was a one-room affair with me behind a desk with the cash register just inside the store's entrance. I'd only had the job for about a month when a friend dropped by just to talk. After a bit, he asked me if the store owners had provided me with any kind of protection given what a nasty neighborhood it was. I told him, just this old double-barreled shotgun that's kept under the counter here, but it's empty. With that, I reached down and picked up the shotgun to show him. Unbeknownst to me, two armed robberies had just gone down on a fast food restaurant and another business close by within a couple of blocks, and the police were responding to the calls in full force. I heard the sirens but didn't think much of it because sirens were pretty common. A police car swerved into the parking lot in front of the store and the officer jumped out of his car and dashed in to check if the robbers weren't hitting my store too. The cop burst through the front door seconds after I'd picked up the shotgun to show my friend. Him coming through the door as fast as he did startled me and without thinking, I turned toward him with the shotgun in my hands and it was inadvertently pointed at him. His gun was holstered and I had the drop on him. At that moment, he didn't know if I was the perp who just robbed the other stores or what. His face went paper white. Both of our minds were blown at the exact time. I quickly laid the gun down and let him know there was no harm intended. But I'm pretty sure he's never forgotten that particular oh crap moment and hey, neither have I. Story 13. Just checked into my shift. As I turned my patrol car on, my radio was in mid-broadcast about an accident just outside of the city I work in. I voluntarily checked en route to help out the best I could. While heading there, I was informed that it was actually closer to the next city over, but that I would still be the first one there. I was then told it was a head-on collision. I arrived on scene about a minute later. It was, in fact, a head-on collision. Five people from one vehicle were not wearing seatbelts. All five were fatally injured beyond any measure. There was nothing I could do. A doctor showed up on the scene shortly after me. Nothing he could do either. I watched two adults and three children die in front of my eyes. The six-year-old little girl just stared at me, unblinking as she passed. I still get emotional. They were students at our elementary school. I knew them because I routinely go to that school just to see the little kids and give them junior police stickers. I take pictures with them and let them play with my gadgets and police car. I went to the memorial service that the school put on for the girls to pay my respects. Their father was there and didn't know who I was or that I was the first one there or what I saw. He was talking to another father, clearly in between denial and anger phases, about how he wished he knew what officer it was on scene so he could unalive him for not doing anything, and why that officer didn't do anything and basically blaming me for their deaths. That was really hard to hear. I wish I was a superhero and could have used magic powers to save those poor children. I'm sorry, little ones. You deserved to live your lives. This is just an incredibly mature person who wrote this. Being able to fully understand, it's like, yeah, that father is in grief, and although it hurts to hear, he didn't get mad at him or anything, so that's... It's nice to hear, basically. Horrible, horrible situation, though. Please wear seatbelts. It's so easy, and the likelihood it can save your life in a crash is astronomical. Story 14. Former paramedic. Known former gang member and seriously bad dude who was suffering from epilepsy. It was known that when he was postictal after the seizure, he would revert to his gangland days and anyone in uniform he wanted to fight. And look, ambulance drivers wear uniforms. Got a call to his known address. 
Me and my partner are the first to arrive on scene. I already had gotten the Valium and Verst drawn up and was ready to hit him with a knock you the hell out dose. As I got to the door, his mother, a very sweet lady, was hollering, He's coming too! I jumped on top of him and with all my might held him down and rode him like I was on the pro bull riding rodeo tour. My partner was able to get the meds into him, I am, which takes longer to work than IV. So I had to do that for the next five to seven minutes till fire showed up. I was exhausted and not really wanting to get my butt beat. I rode that bull till five more guys took over. I rolled off and was just done. Three hours later, I ended up back at the hospital and he was in there. He apologized. Always did. And said he never fought with anyone as tough as me. Thank God for being 40 pounds heavier and a pocket full of mind-altering drugs. Story 15. When I was a corrections officer, I got assigned to shadow an experienced officer until an FTO would be available to train me. It didn't take long to figure out that the CO was highly unpopular among the inmates. My moment was when we went into a 50-man dorm to do a roster slash bed check, and there was absolute silence in the dorm. I could feel the hair standing on the back of my neck. The inmates were intently staring at the officer I was shadowing. He was oblivious to it, while I was in straight-up fight-or-flight mode. Never experienced that in a dorm after that. I feel like something serious was potentially going to go down that night. 2 on 50 is not good odds. I couldn't have been happier when I didn't have to shadow that guy anymore. Story 16. For unattended deaths in my town, law enforcement is typically called in to make sure there's nothing suspicious going on before EMS or coroner or funeral home take over. One day in the dead of summer when it had been 90s for a full week, we got a call about an unattended death. We get there and go into the front door and instantly we know by the smell that this guy has been here a while and the AC is not running. It's easily 90 degrees downstairs, but he's upstairs. He's normally a pretty big guy. Stats from DMV said something like 350 pounds, but he was ballooned up from the heat and decomposition and reminded me of a gray violet Beauregard from Willy Wonka. As they're trying to get him into the body bag, the skin starts slipping. Juices start oozing and the smell gets exponentially worse. That's about the point my sergeant decided we could wait until after the body was loaded to go back in. The image of that guy literally falling apart in the EMT's hands is something that will never leave me. Well, I was going to end it on that one, but I refuse to. That is simply too disgusting. We will find one more. Story 17. Me and my partner needed to make an arrest to fill our quota, so we were patrolling a known drug area in uniform for an easy one. As soon as we get there, we see a plainclothes unit holding one. We go over to make sure they're all good, and they ask if we were looking. We said, sure, easy possession arrest, and we didn't have to hunt. It wasn't until he was handcuffed in the back of the van and radioed in the one under when we saw the plainclothes cop laughing and waving. Driving away, I thought that was odd. And then the smell hit. I can't explain to you in words what a homeless, crackhead diarrhea smells like, but I will never forget it. Had to hose him down, spray him with cologne, and get him new clothes. What a frickin' night that was. No, no, one more. Come on. Story 18. Had a call come out as a crash without injuries. Rolled up to the call with my partner, myself, and another unit. The guy had crashed into his own front yard, but there was no property damage. When I tried to get the guy to sign a crash statement, he told me he didn't want to, and that he hadn't slept for 10 days. Then he told my partner that he had just gotten out of the hospital after an evaluation. It was cold outside, so we let him sit in the back of my buddy's cruiser while he filled out the statement of what happened. He kept making statements like, Just end me, man. And, guys, just blow my head off right here. My partner called the hospital just to make sure he didn't escape or something. And the guy wasn't going to receive a citation at all since it was his own property that got damaged. Just a tow to his driveway, which was right there, and that's it. While walking back to the back of the cruiser to let him out, the guy pushed open the door when my partner opened it and yelled, Let's go, mother frickers, before attempting to tackle him. All three of us jumped on top of him and began trying to hold him down while he kept screaming. He then reached up and bit my partner on the arm. We got him in cuffs, then transported him to the hospital where we had to fight with him two more times in the hospital and he bit a nurse. Everyone was okay and it ended up being that he was just mentally unstable with no drugs involved. Fine. I guess this one will have to be fine with ending on. I hope the guy got the help he needed though. That is really an oh crap moment when all of a sudden this guy just attacks you. So at least the story fits the prompt. Anyway, I am glad we're not going to end on such a gross one though. I don't know, I just never like doing that. But I hope you enjoyed the video, and I also hope you have a wonderful day or night wherever you are. I will see you in the next one.